Well, good morning, everybody. Glad to be here, even though there was six woos. Yeah, I, 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 I don't come for the woos. And you, and you didn't come for me. You came for Jesus. And so who cares about Pastor Adam? Let's hear it for Jesus today. Hey. <laughs> Uh, it's good to be here. Pastor Andy and I, we like to switch every once in a while. If you are uh, visiting with us or if you're new to us or if you've never met me before, my name's Adam. I'm the campus pastor of our West Shore location. And so this morning, Pastor Andy's in the West Shore. I am downtown. We are doing a little flip-flop. So what you see is what you get. Don't get upset. And so welcome to church. You know, as, uh, as Pastor Lucas mentioned, we are um, in the middle of our Family Vibes series. And so if you are new to us or visiting with us. Um, this is a great series for your first Sunday because in it, what we're doing is we're actually exploring a little bit of our heartbeat here as a church. This is, our, this is what it means to be part of Coastline Church. We're going through different values of ours. We're going through different things that are near and dear to our heart as a church. And so you picked a really great Sunday to be here. This morning, specifically, what I'm going to be speaking on is actually one of our pillars but it's actually this whole idea of discovering your purpose. And as a church, we, we do what we do in many ways to help you discover your purpose, discover who you are in Jesus. What makes you tick? Why are you here? What is God's plan for your life? This is a huge piece of what we do here at Coastline Church. And uh, one of the ways that I want to communicate this to you this morning is by highlighting a particular person in the Bible that you've likely never heard of before. This man's name is Epaphras. And Epaphras is a fascinating character. He's a, a church planter. He's a missionary. He's an evangelist. He actually has three different shout outs in the Bible that we're gonna read through together in just a moment. But what I like about Epaphras is oftentimes when we read the scriptures, we, we kind of put people on a pedestal. And we say, oh, I could never be like Peter. Like Peter, he walked on the water. I can never be like Peter. I can never be like Paul. Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament. I can never be like a Paul, maybe a doubting Thomas, because we all doubt sometimes. That's an easier threshold. But, but there's this piece of Epaphras that I like because Epaphras represents so much of you and me. He's kind of this nameless person, regular, everyday human being, much like you, much like me. And what's beautiful about Epaphras, what's applicable, why he's interesting, is because this particular character, he discovered his purpose. He figured out who he was. He figured out how he was wired. And what he did then from that vantage point, once he knew his purpose, he began to live out his faith in a way that impacted communities, in a way that impacted an entire region, in a way that planted churches, in a way that impacted people for eternity. And there's this piece of my heart as I was preparing for this morning's message where I was saying, God, if we could just be like Epaphras, if we can grab a piece of that, not striving to be somebody we're not, but just owning who we are and leading from that vantage point, whew, what, a, what, a, what a world we could live in. So if you have your Bible with you, I would encourage you to turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. If you don't have your Bible with you, it'll be up on the screen. But I just want to read those three shout outs to Epaphras. Because if it's good enough to get your name in there, we should probably read about it, shouldn't we? So it starts off like this. First Colossians, I mean Colossians chapter 1, verse 6, starts off like this. The gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the, world, the whole world. Amen. That's a beautiful thing. It goes on to say, just as it has been doing amongst you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who has also told us of your love in the spirit. Okay, flipping your page over to Colossians chapter four, verse 12, it says these words. It says, Epaphras who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus sends his greetings. 
He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all of the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those of Laodicea, Laodicea, Laodicea and Hierapolis. And the final shout out is found in the book of Philemon. This is a great book if you want to impress somebody. Say, hey, I read a whole book of the Bible. It's only one page, okay? One pager. You don't have to tell anybody. Just, you read the whole book of Philemon. Now you sound super spiritual. Philemon chapter one, verse 23 says, Epaphras, our character of the morning, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. Let's pray, shall we, before we jump into this. Lord, thank you for everybody that's here. And Lord, thank you for your word. And thank you, God, that you're real. God, I pray this morning that you would speak to us through your scriptures. God, that we'd be able to leave here different than the way that we came in. God, I thank you, Lord, that your word is sharper than a two-edged sword, that it has the ability to pierce our very hearts. So Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? God, we need you. We thank you for what you're doing. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So what I want us to do this morning is actually look at six characteristics that were highlighted from those three particular verses of Scripture. These six characteristics at first glance may seem not all that amazing. But what's fascinating about these six pieces of Scripture, these six descriptors of Epaphras, is that hidden in these little descriptions is what I would call the, 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 the secret essence of the Christian faith. And so let's look at these together. The first one's found in Colossians chapter one, verse seven. And it starts with four little words. Our dear fellow servant. If you have a New Living Translation Bible in front of you, you would have read the words, our beloved coworker. Now, I want to highlight in the first glance, like if, you are, if your goal when you read the scriptures is just to get from point A to point B, like if your goal is just to crush as much Bible as you can so you can impress your wife and say, look, honey, I read the whole Bible. <laughs> like if that's your goal, you're going you're gonna to miss out. What's helpful when you read the Bible is to, to dig into the nuances, to slow down. It's not about how much you read, it's about how much the Bible reads you. And so sometimes in order to do that, you need to slow right down and look at it piece by piece, word by word, verse by verse. And so here we have these four little words, our dear fellow servant. You see, what we see in those four little words is this idea that Epaphras didn't practice his faith alone. He's a fellow servant. He's a beloved co Worker. Epaphras didn't practice his faith alone. He was part of something much bigger than himself. Friends, Christianity actually comes alive in community. Now, I understand fully that in order to become a Christian, a person needs to have a personal, intimate, one on one relationship with Jesus. Okay, so in that sense, Christianity is very private. Like I need to have a personal relationship with Jesus in order to become a Christian. You do not become a Christian because your spouse is a Christian. You don't become a Christian because you grew up in a Christian home. You don't become a Christian because you're born in a Christian country, if that even exists. Like you don't become a Christian through other things or other people. It is actually up to you. You and Jesus, and your personal relationship with Jesus, that is what makes a person a Christian. However, the way we interact with other people, this is how we contextualize our Christian faith. Christianity starts with a relationship with Jesus, but it's actually lived out in community. It's lived out rubbing shoulders to shoulder with other, other people. Think about it. If at the, at the core of the Christian faith is Jesus' teaching where he says, you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. It's equally as important, Jesus says. So if at the core of Christianity is to love God and love others, if we then isolate ourselves from those around us, 
we miss out on the opportunity to impact the people that are around us. Like that is part of the Christian journey. Listen to me, please don't, don't waste your time. Don't waste your life. Every single person in this room matters to God. Whether you believe in him or not, that's the beauty of it. Every single person in this room was designed by God. Whether you believe in a creator or not, that's a beautiful thought. Everyone in this room has a purpose. It is to say you were created on purpose by God, an intelligent designer, but for a purpose as well. And everyone in this room has the capacity to impact somebody else's life. But nobody in this room can do it by yourself. We need each other. We need each other. And this is why the Bible goes into detail about describing the church. It uses this analogy of the body. And it describes the church as a body, a church made up of complementary parts working together just like the human body. It speaks to this idea that each of us, even though we're unique and we're different, together, hand in hand, we create a body. We need to be in this together. Epaphras didn't practice his faith alone he was part of something bigger than himself. And so it's entirely possible that there may be people in this room where coming to church today isn't part of your regular routine. And you may even have convinced yourself that you don't need to come to church in order to be a Christian. Let me rephrase that thought for you. You don't need to come to church in order to become a Christian. But if you want to stay a Christian, you're going to need people in your life. You need people who walk with you, who help you, to grow with you. And that's what we want to commit to do with you alongside of you here at the church. Number two, it says, it describes Epaphras as a faithful minister of Christ in Colossians chapter one, verse seven. A faithful minister of Christ. You see, Epaphras was faithful when it came to the way that he lived out his Christianity. He wasn't kind of, sort of, slightly Christianish, right? He wasn't like Christian at church, but then like homeboy at home. There wasn't like Christian Epaphras and like party Epaphras and like university Epaphras and like bro dude Epaphras. Like Epaphras was Epaphras. He was a Christian through and through. He was faithful when it came to the way that he expressed his relationship with Jesus. Because he understood something. And let me let you in on a little inside secret. If your Christianity this morning is centered on anything other than Jesus, I can predict right now, and I can assume that your Christianity is probably very disappointing at times. Because if your Christianity is just about coming to church, we're going to disappoint you. And if your Christianity is just about how much Bible you read and how much time you spend alone by yourself, you're going to feel very lonely. And if your Christianity is about anything other than Jesus, you're selling yourself short. And I can assume that your your faith probably feels a little lackluster. (laughs) And your prayers probably feel sometimes as though they bounce off the ceiling. Because your Christianity isn't meant to be about works or things that you do. It's all supposed to boil down to Jesus. And we live in a very interesting culture right now. And our culture right now is obsessed with discovering and living your own truth. Find your truth and follow it. Discover your truth. What's true to you matters. Be your truth. You want to be happy? You want to be fulfilled? Figure out your truth. What is your truth? What is my truth? And this thinking isn't biblical. 
And this thinking has infiltrated the church. And let me remind you of a very helpful scripture when it comes to truth. These are Jesus's words. Jesus, the one who put the stars in the sky, the one who, who, who spun our earth into motion, the one who pulls up the mountains and, and pours out the waters, the Jesus who intimately and intricately knit you together in your mother's womb. This is his definition of truth. You know what he says? He says, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through me. We don't come to the Father through Coastline Church. And we don't come to the Father through, through trying to memorize this book. And we don't come to the Father just through, through prayer and prayer alone. We come to the Father through Jesus. We come to the Father through Jesus. If you want to find enlightenment, and if you want to find truth, and if you want to find your purpose, and you want to discover who you are, why you're wired the way you are, then you need to back up. And you need to go to the creator. And that creator is Jesus. And he, he is where truth is found. Number three. Amen, Adam. That was really good. So, got to amen myself sometimes in here. Sheesh. Number three. One of you. That's what it said. Epaphras is one of you. Now, again, it'd be so easy just to flip over that and think to yourself, who cares? Well, that's a weird thing to say about somebody. But it was really important that we understand that Epaphras was one of the people. Epaphras was a, a local leader. And if I can let you in on a little insider secret, Christianity comes alive when you learn to bloom where you're planted. Nobody wins. Not you, not anybody else. Nobody wins if you keep waiting for some arbitrary future date to get serious about your faith. I'll tell you right now, your kids are not waiting to judge your Christianity based off the future version of the more Christian you. Your kids right now are watching the way that you interact with culture, watching the way you talk about church, watching the way you talk about Christians, watching the way you raise them, and they are making their opinions as to whether or not this book is believable. They're making their opinions as to whether or not our worship in here actually makes any sense at all. So they're not waiting for the future, better, more Christian version of you. They're making their opinions on Jesus based off the way you live right now. And that is both a sobering and startling realization. Who is God sending you to right now? Who is God placed in your sphere of influence? Who is God placed in your pathway that you interact with on a daily basis right here and right now? Because let me be honest with you. The, the mission field isn't necessarily overseas. We, all, we always like to think like that. The mission field is somewhere far off where missionaries go. No! The mission field is everywhere that you place your feet. I wish we had a door, a sign on that door when you walked out this morning that said, welcome to the mission field. This room right here, this is kind of like the huddle. This is where we come in and we spend our time with Jesus and we huddle up and then we get off the pew, we get off the bench and we go out into the real world and onto the game. We go out there to be Christian. Here's the problem for some of you. You come in here to be Christian and then you go back into real world and say, God, where are you? Jesus doesn't live at Coastline Church. I wish he did. It'd be way cooler. But he doesn't live here. Do you know where, where he lives? It's even cooler. Inside your heart. So everywhere that you go, he goes. Everything you experience, he experiences. All those things that frustrate you and break your heart, they break his and frustrate him too. And he's with you. Amen again. That was really good. I, I am crushing it right now. <laughs> Number four. 
always wrestling in prayer. He's described as always wrestling in prayer. Now, I, I was born in the 80s, which means that I was raised on WWF. <laughs> and when I think of wrestling in prayer, I think of Terry the Hulk Hogan ripping his shirt off. <laughs> if I was wearing two shirts, I would have done that right now. It would have been exciting. <laughs> it would have been amazing. This is a like the descriptor, like the word to describe who Epaphras was, was that he was always wrestling in prayer. See, Epaphras was, was relentless and he was active in his prayer life. And Christianity comes alive when prayer for others becomes a regular part of your lifestyle. See, it's important that we learn to pray to God and that God can impact us. And that's like level one. That's the starting point. You know, when the scriptures talks about like older believers still drinking milk, that's what it's getting to. This idea that our prayer life only revolves around my relationship with Jesus. You wanna know what Christian maturity is? We start to mature as Christians when we stop praying only for ourselves and start praying for others. And you'll notice, I can assure you, you will notice a change in your Christian walk, like a measurable change. Like, like I used to be 20 pounds overweight and now I've lost 20 pounds. Like, like, like it's visible, it's seeable. You can see it, you can feel it. You will notice a visible change in your Christian walk when you begin to pray more about others than you do about yourself. And this may be some of your next step. In this next week, you're gonna start trying to pray more for others than you do for yourself. I don't remember where I heard this. It's probably Pastor Andy, but he's not here, so we'll pretend it's mine. <laughs> Just kidding. It's probably Pastor Lucas. Who knows who said it? But it was good. And this was the statement it was, if God were to answer all of your prayers, would the people around you be impacted? Like if God right now said, you know what, Adam, I'm gonna answer every prayer you've ever prayed. Would other people be impacted or will I just have gotten A on the test I didn't study for? <laughs> right, or get that really close parking spot at Costco. <laughs> Because sometimes this is what our prayer life looks like. God, give me a really great parking spot. God, please let me get an A. I didn't study. God, please let, let, me, let me get this promotion. I really want the promotion. God, I really want a car, a new car. And inadvertently, unintentionally, our prayers are so self-absorbed. And what would it look like if we changed the narrative, switched the perspective, and began to pray for those who are around us? Number five, describes him as working hard. Now, working hard is a fascinating thing. It's one of those things, nobody wants to work hard. We just want to be known for working hard, right? <laughs> that, that's way better. If everyone, if everyone can think I work hard, but I actually don't, that's a win, <laughs> right? right? Unfortunately, this mindset has also impacted us as a church in terms of our, in terms of our personal faith, in terms of our relationship with Jesus, I want all the benefits of being an on-fire Christian. I just don't want to actually be on fire because that may cost me something. See, Epaphras worked hard for the cause of Christ. Epaphras put his money where his mouth was. Epaphras was just as much a Christian in here on a Sunday as he would have been at home when he was alone. He worked hard. And let me let you in on a secret that I learned a long time ago. My Christianity began to come alive when I learned to value calling over comfort. When I was able to make that shift from Lord, this is what I'm called to do, or to Lord, I wanna be, remain comfortable, Everything shifted. 
There's that scripture in the Bible that says the, the, harvest, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. You know that scripture verse? I would venture to guess that a, a modern 2023 translation would sound more like the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are comfortable. Comfort. Just, if we can shake anything off us as a Christian, it would be our desire to be comfortable. When I think of who we are as a church, when I think of Christianity, I realize that, that we weren't designed to be comfortable. God, God literally chose the church to be his rescue plan for humanity. That's what we are. That's what our opportunity is. We're called to be risk takers and influencers. We're called to be innovators and outliers. We're called to be nonconformists. We are meant to be change agents, trend setters, not just trend followers. We're, we're, we're called and designed to be ripple makers, to be pioneers. We're not designed, we were never created to just go with the flow and blend into culture and inevitably disappear. We were never designed just to, just to gather and hide from the world and put on great conferences and concerts. We were never designed to just entertain Christians and help Christians become better Christians. Our goal, our hope, our mandate is to be the hope of the world. And we do that through Christ. And we do that by being uncomfortable. And we do that by pursuing the call of God no matter what it means. Amen, 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 amen. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but James 4, verse 17, speaks to this idea. And this is what the, the brother of Jesus says. So if anybody's gonna know how Jesus works, it's gonna be the brother of Jesus. And James is Jesus' brother. And this is what Jesus, or James wrote. He wrote, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. Sin. There are dreams in this room that have yet to be accomplished. Not because God isn't good, not because God isn't faithful, but because you're scared. There are dreams that have yet to be accomplished not because God isn't good, not because God doesn't want to use you, but because you're comfortable. And Jesus, would you forgive us for idolizing comfort over calling? There's too much at stake, friends. You do not know the people whose lives are yet to be impacted as a result of your faithfulness. Now, some of you may be being called. You can sense it in your spirit. You know, I, like my daughter right now is in Thailand with our, mission, with our missions team. And she felt that call. I want to go into missions. I want to go on a missions trip. And some of you, that's real. God is calling you into the mission field. And some of you, God wants to take you there. But for some of you, it may be a lot more personal and a lot less glamorous. It may look like starting a family devotional that is regular. It may look like talking to somebody that you said you would never talk to them in a million years because they hurt you. It may be learning to forgive them. It may be starting a new business. It may be selling everything and moving somewhere else. You may be in a, a, a dating relationship that you know, you know you're not supposed to be in. Where it's comfortable and you don't want to hurt their feelings. It's a dating, not marriage, just so you know. <laughs> no easy outs on this one. <laughs> if you're married, do the work. Number six. Describe as Epaphras, we'll close with this. He describes Epaphras as a prisoner of Christ. Now, Jesus wasn't going around taking prisoners. 
So it's not like he was like Jesus' inmate. <laughs> Didn't work like that. But what it speaks to is this idea that, that Epaphras was put into jail because of his faith in Jesus. Epaphras paid a price for his Christianity and he was imprisoned because of his faith. And Christianity comes alive. We've literally got a sign out there on the side of the street on Quadra that says, there is life here. Christianity comes alive when we learn to value treasure in heaven over treasure on earth. It comes alive when our Christianity moves from God, what can you do for me? To God, what can I do for you? That's where the change comes. That little posture shift. God, what can you do for me? God, what can I do for you? I can't, I can't promise you a life without suffering and I wish I could. And I can't promise you a life without persecution. Because the Bible, Bible says it. In fact, I welcome it. I hope we get more. The Bible says that if you're actually a Christian, you're gonna get persecuted. And if you haven't felt any level of persecution in your life, just think about that. I can't promise you that if you become a Christian, your life will be easier. But what I can promise you this morning is that if you surrender your life to Jesus and discover your purpose, you will discover a fulfillment that is second to none. As I said earlier, my biggest prayer for us this morning is that we be able to learn from Epaphras, a normal person just like you and me, and Epaphras is fascinating because he's a person who knew his purpose and lived out his Christianity well. So I looked up the word Epaphras. I was like, what does this name mean? I bet you it's gonna be something cool. And it was not. His name means lovely. Oh, what a lovely doily. That is a very lovely flower. Thank you for the lovely cup of tea. That's what I think of when I hear the word lovely. After I stopped making fun of him, the Lord spoke to my heart. And the word lovely, of all the things that describes Epaphras, he's characterized by love. That's who Epaphras is. That's why he does the things that he does. He's characterized by love. Says you're lovely. And we are lovely because Christ first loved us. And so if you find yourself here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your personal, you and Him, Lord and Savior, like the way I was talking about Jesus, you, you, you've come to church, you've had, you have Christian church, you have Christian Bible, you have Christian prayer, you get that, but like Christian, like you and Jesus, maybe you haven't made that step yet. And you can start a relationship with Jesus. You can become a Christian today. And there may be some of you in this room where your Christianity over the last few months, years maybe, has become about things other than Jesus. And today, you can get things right with God. So can I ask you to bow your head and close your eyes for a moment just to create a safe space between you and God. Forget about everybody else in this room. This is you and Jesus right now. If you would like to start a relationship with Jesus or restart your relationship with Jesus, can I invite you to slip your hand up in the air and I'd love to pray for you real quick. Is there anybody in this room? Yeah, I see your hand. Anybody else? Yeah, yes, yes. I see you, yeah, I see you, yes. Anyone else? Yes, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. There's hands everywhere. So if you raised your hand, I want you to pray with me. And if you didn't raise your hand, pray along with me too. 
It's an easy prayer. Sorry, thank you, please. Dear Jesus, in this moment, I just want to apologize. Sorry for making Christian, sorry for making life all about me. I didn't know any better. Sorry for the things that I've done that have hurt others, the things that I've done that have hurt you, the things that I've done that have inadvertently hurt me and I didn't even realize it. God, I'm sorry. Thank you that you're real. Thank you that you love me, that you created me for a purpose, on purpose. Thank you that as we talked about during communion, you died on a cross for me and my sins. Thank you, Lord, thank you. Would you please come into my life? Would you please show me what it looks like to be a Christian in 2023? Would you show me what it looks like to be a Christ follower? Not just in this room, not just in this moment, but every day, 24 seven, Jesus, would you be the Lord of my life? I need you, Lord. And I thank you, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Why, why don't you stand with me one more time? And I actually, I actually would like to pray one more prayer over everybody as the band comes and we'll step into a time of worship to conclude the service. But we're in our 100 year anniversary month and God has done a lot of really exciting things in this church over the past 100 years. And it's easy to look back and say, God, thank you for those 100 years of memories. And it's one thing to look forward and say, God, we thank you in faith for the, the next 100 years. But sometimes what we forget is that history is actually written in present day moments, right? It's not like big epic things that happened in yesteryear, but anything that was big and excited that ever happened in the past they were the result of faith in a present moment. So I want to encourage you. We have history to write still. And you are here not out of some kind of accident or circumstance. But I believe with everything inside of me that you are here this morning because God wanted to awaken something inside of you and remind you that you are called and created that you're created on purpose, for a purpose, that he has a plan for you. So would you close your eyes with me and we'll pray one more time. Jesus, I thank you for each and every person in this room. And I thank you for who they are in you. I thank you that you've got a plan and a purpose for each and every person. I thank you, Lord, that you've got different and diverse callings, gifts, anointings, and purposes. But Jesus, in this moment, we thank you for what it is that you are going to do as a result of the faith inside this room. Father, would you teach us and show us how to be Christian at home? Would you teach us and show us how to be a Christian with our spouse? Would you teach us and show us how to be Christian parents, Christian coworkers, Christian students? God, would you help us to bring what you're doing in here home with us, Father? Would you forgive us for trying to do things in our own strength? Would you forgive us for trying to make Christianity just about a space, a gathering, a moment? Would you forgive us, Father, for trying to... Would you forgive us, Lord? Because, Father, we want to be used by you. So, Lord, where we have been seeking after comfort... And where we've been putting our dreams that you've given us on the shelf. God, we draw that line in the sand today. And Father, I just call and declare that we'd be a church of risk takers again. A church of pioneers. A church of trendsetters. A church of ripple makers. A church that is so humbly committed to the work and cause of Christ that the nation can't help but notice. Thank you, Jesus, for what it is that you've done. And thank you, Lord, for what it is that you're gonna do. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. And everybody said, amen. Amen.